Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about hypertension and its effects on the different parts of the human body. In this country, there are 1.3 million people, 103 million, I'm sorry, 103 million people who suffer from hypertension. Across the world, 1.5 billion people suffer from hypertension. One out of every three adults in this country suffer from hypertension, and in the Negro slash black community, it is one out of every two adults suffer from hypertension. All the end organs to uh, suffer from one degree or another from the effect of elevated blood pressure. The end organs are, of course, the brain, the eyes, the heart, the kidney. In fact, the entire high flow system, namely the arterial system, is affected to one degree or another once the pressure is elevated and it remains so for a very long time, either not well treated or not treated at all. Now, I was talking about the heart, what happened to the heart last week. I'm going to continue with that in this segment. One of the most common problems that happen to the heart, of course, when the pressure is high, is congestive heart failure. Sure, you could have angina, you could have a heart attack and cardiac arrhythmias, no problem. These are all true. In both books that are in front of me, The Art and Practice of Modern Clinical Medicine and African American Women Health, there are at least six different chapters they're dealing with atherosclerotic heart disease and different components of it. And one of the problems that there are, first of all, there are five point uh, seven million people in this country suffer from congestive heart failure. And of course, the vast majority of the Negro such black community that suffer from hypertension, I mean from congestive heart failure, they suffer from it because of elevated blood pressure. Not because they had a heart attack or anything of that sort. That can happen as well, but I'm speaking specifically about something we call hypertensive heart disease. Hypertensive heart disease is because of the constant pumping of the heart against the resistance. The resistance meaning the high blood pressure. The muscles of the heart becomes enlarged. And once the muscle of the heart becomes enlarged, eventually it cannot pump that well anymore, and it fails. And that's one of the most common causes, of course, of congestive heart failure. And as I say, 5.7 million people suffer from congestive heart failure. And of course, if you have a heart attack, you could have what we call acute congestive heart failure, also known as pulmonary edema. That's not what I'm talking about. That occurs because the heart muscle has been so damaged so abruptly, the heart loses its pumping capability acutely, and fluid accumulates in the lung. Patient develops shortness of breath, and there are an acute crisis from something called pulmonary edema. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the condition that allows someone to, for years, not to get treated at all for the blood pressure, which is quite common. There are roughly, of the 103 million people who suffer from hypertension in this country, roughly 45% of them either are seeing physicians. Uh, of those that are seeing physicians, some 28% of them are being treated adequately. The rest, not so adequately. So you have roughly 55% of people who have hypertension. They don't even know they have it. And then by the time they realize it, they develop hypertensive heart disease and a whole lot of other issues, and that's it. Now, of course, the symptoms of congestive heart failure, usually tiredness, headache, uh, shortness of breath, uh, inability to basically go from here to there, to get tired very easily. And part of it is because the heart is not able to pump sufficient blood to the brain to allow the brain to function properly, and not able to pump sufficient blood to the kidney, et cetera, and other organ, and the person is tired. And one of the things that can, in fact, happen is also anemia. Even though excessive anemia can cause, that's a different thing, but, anemia, but chronic of failure itself can cause somebody to become anemic, and I'll explain to you how that happens. So those are the symptoms, shortness of breath, Tiredness, insomnia, depression, 
just feel lousy, blah, 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 if that's a proper term. And chest pain can occur as well because of that. Then you will go to see the doctor. The doctor will evaluate you, take the history, etc., and find out your pressure is in fact high. And also during the process of examining you, the, pressure, the doctor might hear what we call arouse in the lung, which is basically fluid in the lung, etc. And sometimes people develop swelling of the legs and lower legs, etc. Uh, abdomen sometimes can happen, and those kind of things. And the doctor will proceed clearly to evaluate the problem. One of the things you're going to do, you do a complete blood count, which is a CBC, you do a complete uh, metabolic profile, which is a blood chemistry profile. Then the doctor will proceed to do what's called a BNP, and also go right ahead to the renal function test, etc., and do the thyroid evaluation, etc., do all that kind of stuff. And then we'll proceed as well to do an EKG and a chest x ray and very importantly, or the, an echocardiogram. Now, some of these things can be gotten right away, if, especially nowadays where we have large groups, people have laboratory in their offices, they have x-rays available, echocardiogram, the cardiologists definitely have that, the EKG is readily available, the chest x-ray, they could do that. So the same day you can get some of this stuff on, or the patient is in fact in the emergency room. And all these things can be gotten within an hour or two in the emergency room. And of course, the patient also have lack of oxygen, okay, because they, 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 you just need oxygen, so it's, that's crucial. Yeah. That we get all that thing done, but now we have to begin the process of most important of all, to treat this patient. And that's where I want to take some time to explain to you what is going on in this segment. Namely, both the kidney plays a major role in the causation and also you need the kidney to help you in the treatment of the patient. You say, well, how can the kidney is involved in the causation of someone who has heart failure? Well, here we go. Once the heart is not able to pump properly, the, what we call the cardiac output is low, the kidney is not being perfused properly, not getting enough blood and oxygen. And the kidney senses that. The kidney is a very sensitive organ. Once the kidney senses that not enough blood and oxygen is getting in, as far as the kidney is concerned, the body is in trouble, which is true. And there's a substance the kidney produces called aldosterone. And right away, the kidney's job is to raise the level of the aldosterone so as to protect the kidney from dying out, because the, the kidney doesn't know any other way of doing it. So once the level of aldosterone is high, that in fact makes matters worse because aldosterone is a salt retainer. I say this to say that everyone who suffers from chronic congestive heart failure, therefore, have high total sodium body in excess. Your total body sodium is elevated because you are holding on to aldosterone, and aldosterone is holding onto the salt so as to protect the body, but it's really not, it's making matters worse, it's also holding onto water. So that's how the kidney is involved in the causation and making the congestive heart failure worse. You understand that, okay? On the other hand, you can't treat the congestive heart failure properly without the help of the kidney. There comes the situation. That's when you really have to know what types of medication you're going to need to use in combination to solve, help solve this problem. Because everyone with chronic or heart failure has secondary hyperaldosteronism. That's what I just explained. The aldosterone level is high, and it's, it's chronically high. Therefore, the total body sodium is extremely high. And you can't treat the heart failure if you don't know how to bring the level of aldosterone down and so do and bring down the level of the salt. But here's the deal. Okay, so you're going to use loop diuretic, the long list of loop diuretic, Lasex, Bumex, and 
a whole bunch of them there and the paper that I have in my hand the other day that I was reading to you. But here's the deal, if you're just going to give the patients Lasix, which you are going to, to try to get rid of that, some of that urine so that the salt comes out in it. But you can go so far, because the more Lasix you give, the more you might very well wind up worsening the function of the kidney via another mechanism because there's only so far you can go. So you're going to, you might make my the better transiently, tempor temporarily, but chronically, the more lizard you push in, the, hi the higher the B1 is going to come, the higher the serum creatinine is going to come, and then you got trouble. Then you're stuck. You can't go any farther because you have to cut back on the diuretic. That doesn't make any sense because then now you're really stuck. The reason why I'm telling you all this before you get all your results back is your patient is symptomatic. You can't wait for all this stuff to come, that I just mentioned above to come back before you have to intervene with treatment. You have to do that immediately. Therefore, you must know enough about the physiology of the kidney, the physiology of the heart, the mechanism, what's happening between the two of them. Because those two organs are crucial and the treatment and the management of this congestive heart failure. Well, how do you go about that? Well, there's a combination of medications. I'm going to give you the list, and there's a rationale for each one of them. You're going to use a loop diuretic. It could be Bumex, Lasix, or what have you. Then you're going to attempt to increase, to decrease the forcefulness of the heart by putting a cardiac sensitive beta blocker such as Coreg. What the Coreg does is that it prevents the heart from over pumping because the heart is already weak. It prevents the heart from over pumping and in so doing it decreases the need for oxygen as well. Preserve oxygen. That's one step. That's the second medication. The third medication you're going to put on board is something like a, a nitroglycerin type medication, i.e., in this case, asosorbide, or depending on the circumstances, and acutely, you may have to use a nitro paste acutely because asosorbide takes time to kick in. Nitro paste kicked in immediately. If you're in an emergency room, you're going to put nitro paste in. What does that do? It's a vasodilator. That's exactly correct. The nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, but what do you need to dilate the vessel? But if you don't dilate the vessel that's going into the kidney, you're going to have renal insufficiency. You're going to have pre-renal azotemia. By open up this vessel with the, with the nitroglycerin, you, you allow the, those vessels from being constricting, and you dilate them, the vasodilate, that then decreases the level of the BUN and also the level of the creatinine. So that's the third medication. Okay, then the other medication you're going to put on board, you're going to put on board an alpha blocker, such as apresolin. You got to be careful, because on the side effect of apresolin is tachycardia. You don't want tachycardia in this setting, but you have the beta blocker to protect that. So you can go right ahead and put your apresolin in as a, it is also a vasodilator. So you have your nitrate, with either nitro paste or asosorbide, and you have your apresolin. This is also, you use, you're taking advantage of its vasodilatory effect, and the beta blocker will counteract its side effect, which is increasing the heart rate. So I think that's the fourth medication. Now, now that you've done all that, there's another very important medication. Oh my God, aldactone. You cannot do any of that stuff that I'm telling you without putting aldactone on board. Why is that? Aldactone block, that's the only medication that I know in this country that block aldosterone, which is causing part of the major problem. Aldosterone is fantastic in one sense, but in this sense, it's doing something bad. It's holding on to salt. So you cannot succeed in any way, shape, or manner 
long term if you don't have aldosterone on board. So you must put aldosterone to block the effect of aldosterone. By putting the aldactone, I'm sorry, by putting the aldactone on board, you're blocking the effect of aldosterone. So you're preventing salt from being retained. That helps tremendously in the problem. In addition to that, you've got to be careful. Because one of the side effects of aldactone is to cause the potassium to go up. That potentially can happen. It's a good thing in one sense, because you may not have to add potassium, because you're going to lose some potassium by giving the, the Lasix. And or you may have to, even though you have the adactone on board, you may need to squeeze in a little bit of potassium because depend, you don't know how much potassium the patient is losing. But remember, you are monitoring your renal profile if the patient is in the hospital every day and or every week if it's an office setting. So you're watching that. This combination of medication is called b -deal. Here's the point to remember. When b -deal was just first came out, that research was done in black folks, slash the Negro slash black folks. And it's very important to pay close attention to the word Negro. I am one myself, because a lot of folks, we have many more Negroes in the world than we have Caucasian folks. And if you don't put these things in front of your mind, and keep them in mind as you're practicing clinical medicine, you cannot treat people properly. You think you can, but you cannot. But the physiology is different. So when BDL was created, which is a great medication I just described to you, it was thought that it was only good for black folks. Nonsense. It turns out that in this setting, BDL is just as good for Caucasian as it is for black folks. Every congestive heart patient, congestive heart failure patient in my office, I'm treating them myself as a general internist. Myself, I have no problem, no big deal. I have patients that I've been treating for CHA for the last 20, 25 years. They're doing great, they're working, managing the medication the way I'm supposed to, no sweat. I haven't had one single patient of mine that had decompensated that I'm treating for CHF over the last 30, 35 years. Not a single one, unless of course, something else happened to them like an infection or a heart attack or something, they can become, that's different. But in terms of chronic management, everybody's getting the same medication. Yes, there are differences in the physiology of different ethnic, ethnic groups. But in this setting, the combination of medication I just described to you should be used the same way in all ethnic group, period. It works in everyone the same way. And you cannot practice high power, 21st century, academic clinical medicine by not knowing these things better than you know the palm of your hand. You have to. And when you do so, then your patient have now has had the EKG. The EKG may be normal. The EKG may see some stress-related thing that's going on with the heart. The EKG may show certain arrhythmias actual fibrillation, different type of tachycardia, type of heart block, etc. The EKG is crucial. The chest x-ray is crucial, because the chest x-ray sometimes can show that the heart is enlarged. There may be some fluid at the base of the lung, etc. So the chest x-ray is, is crucial. But most important of all, your echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is absolutely, completely necessary. And the cardiologists, they are flat out fantastic at knowing how to read this stuff, and they're excellent at it. Why is that important? Well, the echocardiogram will show you, was there an, an old heart attack? Uh-huh, you could see that. You could see, the, you could see that in terms of the muscle is weak, it can't pop properly. And then most important of all, is the valves are okay? That's crucial. Is the fluid around the heart? That's crucial. The echocardiogram can tell you that. But most important of all, the echocardiogram will tell you what is the ejection fraction. The EF is crucial because it tells you the ejection fraction is a number. 
that the cardiologist can tell you by looking at the, the calculation is crucial because it tells you how much left, how much strength this follicular heart has got left so that it could pump properly at any, any time, any millisecond. So the, the EF tells you how much pumping ability the heart, the, the heart has lost and how much pumping ability the heart has got left. Crucial, because that helps you to organize your management as well for this patient based on the EF. Those are absolute, that you have no idea how important. Even we, I do medical oncology. When you're going to give the patient certain chemotherapeutic agent, some of them have cardiac toxicity. You have to have a baseline EF so that you know every now and again while the patient is being treated with chemo, you repeat the EF, to see, you repeat your echocardiogram to see is the EF being affected negatively? You have to cut back on your chemotherapy. Those are crucial numbers that you have to have. Then of course, you have also the possibility of doing a 24-hour holter. Yeah, put the patient on a 24-hour holter on the outside. It will tell you the patient have a certain type of arrhythmia that are intermittent or regular. So, so this is how you do a complete cardiac workup. I have not gotten to the point where you may wind up having to need coronary angiogram. Yes, you may have to. First, you stabilize your patients, make your patient better. Then you refer the patient to the cardiologist. They will evaluate. They will determine if the patient also have ischemic heart disease on top of the hypertensive heart disease. The combination can survive and death together at the same time. Because remember, this patient has been hypertensive for a very long time, and he or she have damage done to the vessels, the coronary vessel around the heart. You can't be hypertensive for a very long time, don't have damage to those coronary vessels because the elevated pressure itself, nothing else is necessary. Even though very few people have just one disease. Most people have a combination. That's why we call it cardiovascular disease. A lot of people wind up with high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity at the same time. I see that all the time. We all do. So you can't just say, well, the heart failure is getting better, and you sit there happily with that. That could be dangerous. You must make sure the cardiologist sees the patient, he or she evaluates the patient, to make sure that we don't have a need to do a stress test. The specific stress test nowadays we could do even though the patient has CHF. He or she doesn't have to exercise. We can exercise the heart without the patient walking onto the treadmill. We have ways of doing that. And sometimes you may have to go acutely to the coronary cat lab to get a cat done. Yes, right away. That when you need the help of a cardiologist who's going to help you make a decision after he or she evaluate the patient. Because you don't want to sit there and start treating a patient for CHF, which you will. Also not, the CHF may, a component of it may be coronary occlusive disease. Well, how are you going to know that? Well, that's when your friendly cardiologist comes along. He or she will get involved, help you to evaluate the patient, get the patient to the cat lab if he thinks it's necessary, do a coronary angiogram, then you have a complete picture. You have your echocardiogram. You've had your stress test, maybe. Sometimes you don't need it, you have to do the cat right away. Then you got your 24-hour holter. You got your echocardiogram. I mean, your EKG. You got your chemistry. You got your blood count. You got all that stuff. Your urine analysis. All that stuff is done. And you make sure, make absolutely sure you check the thyroid. Yes. Because if you have hypothyroidism, can be associated with congestive heart failure. Hypo, right can play a role in congestive heart failure as well. Because when you have, when you are hypo, you could retain fluid that way. And then hyper can be associated with arrhythmia. See, you, you, this stuff is gorgeous. It's really clinical medicine. You have no idea how fascinating clinical medicine is. It is really absolutely beautiful. So, but it's all interconnected. You have got to know this stuff. And if you don't know it yourself, my goodness, there are so many colleagues out there who are flat out brilliant at the segment of the stuff that they do. Send the, 
send the patients to them for the sake of the patient. If you're good at this stuff, sure, take care of the patients yourself like I do. I call cardiologists all the time when I need them, but most of the time I take care of the patient myself. The patient is in the hospital, they have a heart attack, of course I'm going to call a cardiologist because the patient may develop some serious arrhythmias that they're hell of a much better at treating than I am, okay? And I need acute help for this patient to save the patient's life. I'm going to get my team together. But when it comes to the chronic stuff, forget about it. I can handle that literally with my eyes closed, okay? But I will never, never for one children of a second deny the patient the right to see a particular specialist if I think he or she needs that help, okay? But, but don't take care of stuff on your own if you're not good at it. But if you are not good at it, there's so many brilliant doctors out there that will be more than happy to help you to help the patient. So therefore then, hypertension itself, forget about all the other incredibly bad stuff, hypertension itself can cause severe congestive heart failure. 5.7 million people out there in this country suffer from that. And the vast majority of Negro slash black folks who suffer from congestive heart failure, they suffer from it because of the hypertension itself. And many thousands of them died every year because of congestive heart failure, because they wait too late to seek help. By the time they heal up, the heart is so enlarged. Now they have balloon procedures that they're doing that's very fancy to try to help the left ventricle uh, to pump more effectively. They can put all these very fancy balloon there. These things work too, yes. No question about that. But you need to have people help you to evaluate this patient to make sure that they need that. If they need it, they're going to have it. But in spite of all that, in spite of all these fancy balloons that are out there, thousands, thousands of people die because of congestive heart failure every year in this country, every year. And this is, the, uh, this, the United States has the most developed form of medical care in, this, in the world. Too expensive, $3.5 trillion, super expensive, but that's the world we're living in. But you just simply have got to know what's available so that you seek the help when you need it. Make sure you have your prayer. You have people in the black community that develop congestive heart, I mean CHF, I mean high, high blood pressure since they were teenagers because of the crisis of obesity. And in all that time, the heart is under stress. And by the time they become young adults, they already have an enlarged heart and they're now suffering from congestive heart failure. Listen, I'm gonna stop here until I see you again, this is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.